Good afternoon, Mark. How are you? Good. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, today is Wednesday, July 17th, 2017, and we're not in Springfield. We're in Champaign. We're at the University of Illinois mm -hmm. at the studios for WILL, and I'm uh, excited about being here. I'm especially excited about doing this interview with you because you've had quite a life, Connie. And we're going to spend a lot of time learning about who you are growing up, and then we're going to spend a lot of time probably tomorrow talking about your experiences as a nurse in Vietnam. But mm -hmm. you lived a full lifetime before you even got to that experience. So let's start with my standard question, and when and where you were born? I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, July 14, 1944. 1944, yes. right in the middle of World War II. Was mm -hmm. your father in the military? He was, yes. During the war itself? Yes. Do you know what he did? He was just a private first class, as far as I know. Was he deployed overseas? No. He didn't go overseas. Okay. And I know there's more than just you and the family. How many siblings do you have? I happen to be the middle of nine. So I have three you're... brothers and five sisters. So your dad already had several kids at home while the war was going on. Yes. Did he, uh, well, what did your dad do for a living? After he got out of the military, he worked at United States Steel in Birmingham. Was he doing that before the war as well? I don't think so. I really don't remember. <laughs> they didn't tell me that part. <laughs> okay. What's your dad's name? His name is Alec. Percy Love, and um, it's spelled strangely with an E, E-L-E-X. How did he end up getting a name spelled like that? Well, back in those days, the midwife delivered, and the doctor came, and somebody didn't know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of his life, he had a fight with people to get it spelled correctly, I would guess. Yes. And uh, what steel company did he work for? Do you know that? U.S. Steel. Okay. And there they call it Tennessee Coal and Iron. How much of his uh, working career did he work at U.S. Steel? The rest of his life. Tell me a little bit about his personality. He had a very deep voice. <laughs> and he was very... Um, touchy about his children. We didn't always know that because he would yell at us a lot. Uh, the yelling though would usually be something he told you to do or, and uh, if he found you done something wrong, he'd line us all up together. <laughs> no matter who did it, you all were there until the one who did whatever he didn't like confessed. But when you say he was touchy about his children. I mean, protective? Very protective. Do you have any examples of that? Well, uh, I can, one thing that he and I both remembered for quite some time, I was about three, and we got on the bus, and the bus driver wanted me to sit up front, but wanted him to sit in the back. And he decided that if that had to happen, then both of us would just get off the bus. So we ended up walking downtown instead of taking the bus downtown. <laughs> Did your dad explain what was going on in that incident? Yes. Um, the colors were supposed to sit in the back of the bus and the whites were supposed to sit up front. And they would have the opportunity of, the bus driver had the opportunity of moving the sign that said colored from here as far back as he wanted to. So. At some points he would, the bus could be completely empty, but he would move the sign for the blacks almost all the way to the back of the bus. How does a three-year-old make sense of that? I probably didn't. <laughs> Just accepted it as the way it was? Yes, yes. But I did want to sit on that bus up front because it seemed to be more attractive up front. <laughs> well, you can see more from up front. Mm -hmm. How about your mother? What was your mother's name? Alice 
and she was from the Chavers family. So she's Alice Chavers before she married. Chavers, C-H-A-V-E-R-S? C-H-A-V-E-R-S. Did she work? No, she was a stay-at-home mom for the whole time. Well, with nine kids, she was, she was working hard, <laughs> I'm sure. Tell me a little bit more about her. Well, she was one of 15. She had 15 brothers and sisters, and uh, she was number three. And as we grew up, one of them had passed away just about the time I was born. And so she was the second, and so she was always considered the matriarch of the family and uh, until she passed away. But she was a, she was a farmer, and so we kept a farm. Uh, they would have it plowed by one of the neighbors, and uh, she would plant, and then the children had to be the water carriers to water it, and then we would have to chop out the weeds and pick the produce and give it away if we could because we didn't really like all those greens that she planted. She inherited the family farm then? No. No, my father actually bought a house that had enough uh, land on it for us to have a garden. Okay. We lived in the city, but at that point my house was the only one on the block. So we had everything that everybody else had at that point. We had a garden. We didn't call it a farm. We just called it a garden. And uh, chickens. We had a cow. We had a few pigs until people started building houses more around us. So we had to let it go. Did you like working in the garden? No. <laughs> <laughs> Because you had to get up too early. <laughs> and so it being hard work. It was hard work. Is that what kept food on the table for you, for the family? Partially. It kept the vegetables there. Uh, my father did work, and they did have grocery stores around. He did not have a car. So the grocery bags then were about this tall from the floor. And so he would come home with a bag of groceries on the bus. But we grew our own vegetables. And uh, the cow, we milked and we made butter. But that wasn't intended to be our source. We called it our pet, but it was food to mama. <laughs> so you drank the milk as well? Yes. Yes. Your, your father... He, you're talking about getting groceries. I wonder if he had to purchase the groceries from a, a company store? A lot of times he did. We that They used the A&P store, so what he came home on the bus with that we saw most of the time was from the local grocery store. But there was times when we heard those mother and daddy's discussions about the company store because she didn't like the fact that, what they call it, you're buying things on time, and then it would cost more later than, you'd have to pay more than what it really cost. And so I guess that's what we call a credit card now. Um, and they would buy shoes there for us. Was he able to um, maintain a, a moderate lifestyle for the family? Pretty big family. Well, as far as we were concerned, we were okay. We didn't know we were poor until I got to graduate school. <laughs> Some of you don't know. <laughs> no, one of the teachers explained what was going on in the South, and he explained our little neighborhood, and I think he even called it a ghetto, but we thought a ghetto had more people in the neighborhood than we had in ours, but that was what it was. It was we were considered poor, but everybody else was about the same as we were. And when somebody had a fire or they had something happen to them, we would be the first ones to go to that garden and fill up one of those grocery bags with vegetables. And we gave, so we figured the other people were poor, we weren't. When you and I first talked, I had this vision of your neighborhood. I didn't know 
that your neighborhood started with your house on one square block and there's no other houses on it? Is that what you said? There were none on, when, when you could, even now, when you see the house, it's the only one on that block. The other ones are turned a different way, but the one on my left was built when I was about seven. And the one that was across the street from us was built when I was about 10. There was another one across the street and up the street. I don't remember now when it was built, but the rest of them were just, that's just the way it was. People built later. Our yard, when I was growing up, what is now the street in front of our house was our front yard. Did your your family own all of that property then on that, that block that there weren't other houses on? I think so, yeah. Well, I wonder if you can kind of paint the picture of the rest of the neighborhood. I mean, it sounds like, I don't want to make any assumptions, it sounds like you're living in a, a working class neighborhood. Would that be a good way to say it? It was working class, yes. Some people worked. <laughs> what else can you tell us about the neighborhood? Well, most of the people who were there, the ones even who built the houses, they stayed there until they passed away. So when I would go away, we would always go back and visit these people. It was like they were always family. Um, even though my mother didn't work when she would go downtown to do whatever shopping she did, probably to buy fabric to make dresses. She'd just leave the children there because all the neighbors, even though they didn't come in to say they were babysitters, we never heard that word, but if any of us got out of order before my mother could get home good, they would all be there to tell her what happened. <laughs> so the neighborhood took care of each other's children and it was just a, it was a, a given that they would do that. Can you describe the home for me, the house itself? The house was very unique. <laughs> Even among the ones around there, it had a pointed top and it was the only one around with this pointed top. And I, after I did a little schoolwork, we looked at it as if whoever built it must have had an African background or something because it was just pointed all the way around. And it had, it was only a four bed, a four room house. There was a living room, a kitchen, and two bedrooms. And the bathroom was outside. An outhouse. Yes. Electricity? We had electricity in my house, yes. Was there indoor plumbing of any type? Was there water in the house? No. The Not water, at all. They had a water faucet on the outside of the house. It was on what we call the back porch. We had a big back porch that covered the whole house. A big front yard, big front porch that covered the whole of the front. So we thought we had a full house, <laughs> but the water was outside. For your entire growing up experience, that you didn't have an indoor plumbing, indoor toilet? I think we must have gotten it when I was about eighth grade. Okay. Because that was the discussion about our, what would our friends think. <laughs> so I remembered my father did, he and the neighbors put in a bathroom inside the house. They built on a little addition to the back of the house and they put the water inside um we had a kitchen they put the kitchen enlarged the kitchen and put it inside um no it was a new kitchen because the other one that had been the kitchen became the dining room uh, we remember we had our bathroom was pink back there all of the fixtures were colored Still in all, one bathroom, 11 people. It had to be a popular room. Well, it was bigger than the galvanized tub that we used to bathe in. <laughs> and we would, from the youngest one to the oldest, we would heat the water on the heat on the stove 
and put cold water in it to make it more. And so the youngest one would bathe, the next one would bathe until you got, mother thought you had too much dirt on you, so you got a fresh, a fresh tub. How often a week were you bathing? That's hard work to do that every day. We did. You had to bathe before you went to bed. Oh. Yeah, so we, we got the bath. But we always got one. We made sure we got it on Saturday night. So we had to go to church on Sunday. So we'd get Saturday night bath. And uh, when, I, when we started off, we had a wood stove in the house. And the gas came, I guess it must have been about 11 or 12 when that happened. Um, Connie, you mentioned that when you're getting indoor plumbing, the comment was made, what will the neighbors think? I'm intrigued by what they meant by saying that. That mm -hmm. were they thinking, boy, now they'll think we're carrying airs that we've, we're so fancy we got indoor plumbing? Or Oh, no, most of them had indoor plumbing. <laughs> so when they built their houses, because they came after us, they put their plumbing inside. And ours had, when the wind would blow, you would know who had the outdoor toilet. Did I ask you already your, your family's last name? Yeah, Love, right? Love, yes. Okay. So the Loves have arrived. They've got indoor plumbing now. Yes. yes. Okay. Was your, let's go back and ask a couple questions about your dad. Um, what kind of days did he work? Did he work long hours? He worked long hours. He also worked what we call swing shift. So he his his hours and days would change. Sometimes he would work seven to three, other days three to set three to eleven, eleven to seven the next morning, and when he did overtime, it's usually double time. I would think during those years, especially the 50s and early 60s, uh, there was plenty of work to be done in the in the steel mill. They kept him pretty busy, I would guess. He stayed pretty busy. He stayed pretty busy, but according to him, he was the money wasn't keeping up. Was he in the union? Yes. Uh, was he proud to be in the union? I think he was. Yes. Now, you'd mentioned before there was even a law case, a court case that he was involved with? Yes. Can you tell me about that? I did not know much about, I, we didn't know anything about the law case until the night before we buried him. And one of his um, co-workers said that it's a shame that Love paid all that money for that lawsuit but he was the only one who didn't get any money from it. So we didn't know about, we'd hear him talking about he was gonna get a lawyer or the people were gonna get a lawyer, but we would always hear him say that the people who were supposed to give him money never gave him money, so he was always putting the money in himself. And, um, so the neighbor told us the night before we buried him, look for love versus U.S. Steel. Because we'd never, all we heard about was the fact that they weren't giving him money. So we really didn't know what it was about. And they didn't tell us what it was about. I went off to college. He still didn't tell me what it was about. We didn't ask. I mean, it wasn't something that they really talked about. Uh, Do you know but what it, the issues of the court case was about? It was basically about seniority. Um, I remembered he invented some kind of a pulley to work in his factory, but he, they used it, but they didn't give him any credit for it. Um, they were always on strike, so we thought it was to help them stop striking so much because when you talk about food, that we found out later that we would have to get the surplus food, as they called it. And that's what carried us through uh, when they won these strikes, and they would be on strike for a long time. But I think the lawsuit was about the fact that 
whenever a white person came in, they had to train them. And sometimes that person would end up being their boss, but they would never be able to get the promotions. So he was working in an integrated workforce, but it didn't make much difference promotion-wise or um, seniority-wise. No. no. Do you remember mm -hmm. the first time that you realized that you were living in a prejudiced world? Yeah, when my daddy told me when we had to pull me off that bus, <laughs> that was a part of it. Um, we used to look at it like the white people, the ones who lived not very far away from us, we would pass their houses. They would usually be friendly, but we never went into their homes. Um, we were just told that we couldn't do it. Um, there was swimming pool around and we could not use it basketball court we couldn't use that um, our school was pretty good about teaching us um, what was going on in fact the, the fact that we never had a new textbook in the school they explained it to us that we had to wait until the white students had learned whatever was in the book and they tear it up and then they give it to us and we would have the charge of covering it to try to make it look pretty even though usually the pages were there when we got them but i have heard it said that birmingham was one of the most segregated cities in the country it was <laughs> your neighborhood i assume then was entirely black yes mm -hmm. okay let's talk about religion for a while was the family religious yes very much so yeah, the family grew up, I think they were extremely religious. Uh, but my mom, the, the motto we had in the house, if, if you're not dead, you're going to church. So if you're going to, you, you can't go to Sunday school, you can't do anything else. Um, there was no such thing as a movie. We didn't have movies anyway, but anything that you wanted to do, other than church, you don't do it on Sunday. And uh, we'd have to go to Sunday school. But because my father worked, so mostly it looks like he always worked those shifts with Saturday into Sunday. He didn't go. So my mother, with all the children she had, she sent us to church. And there was a church in the neighborhood, a Baptist church. Uh, we went there. What was the name of the church? New Salem Baptist Church. And then when our, one of our neighbors built a house and they moved in, his family was Catholic and he was Methodist, so he asked permission to take us to church. So that's how most of us grew up being Methodist because that neighbor took us to church all the time. And I think when my father got to a point where he didn't have to work all Sundays, he belonged to another church, which was African Methodist Episcopal. But it was farther away from home, and it, we did not want to walk, and we didn't want to take the chance of going, so they allowed us to continue to go to church with the neighbor. But when he and my mother went, and the younger ones that were born after me well i wouldn't see, even say after me the last three went to church with the parents somewhere in there kind of you got me confused a little bit you say you uh, sometimes your mother didn't go with the, the rest of the kids to church she didn't go until my father went and then um that wasn't very frequently because i think i must have been about going to high school when my father had his first car. It was the little red truck. So the two of them could ride in the little red truck. And so then that's when she would go to church. She went to church with him. So here's a woman who insisted that if you're not dead, you're going to church, but she's not going to church with you? No. Why not? It wasn't because she had to stay home with the kids, the babies. Okay. Yeah, she stayed home with the babies. But occasionally she would go to the evening services at the Baptist church in the neighborhood. And then when they got a car, 
she and daddy would go. What happens if some of the, I'm sure this didn't happen for you, Connie, but some of the boys maybe suddenly things came out of their mouth that your mom didn't think was appropriate? Not really, because mother had this thing, if it came out, gonna knock your teeth out. <laughs> or she's gonna wash your mouth out with soap. And occasionally she did that. But my brothers were very respectful. And I think the thing was, things that children say today, we call them bad words. You would not call anybody a fool. You would not say they're lying, because those were bad words. So you didn't say that. Was your mom the disciplinarian then? Oh yeah, she was. Um, but then she would say, you're gonna get another one when your daddy comes home. So she would, you would have your peace when she, whenever you did whatever you did wrong, you got it. And with either a strap or a switch. From your mom? Yes. Well, then what happened when Dad got home? Usually he would yell. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't recall very many times that my daddy actually whipped us. We call it whipping. So, But the discipline was sitting down and giving you this long lecture. And sometimes we would rather have the, the switch in than to get the lecture because you had to stand stand in front of him while he lectured. <laughs> was it that or was it the words that he was saying, the, the emphasis and the meaning of the words? Was it mainly just standing in front of him? Well, it was mostly standing in front of him. And it's, I think he would threaten a punishment that he never delivered. So, you know, he was, he was more soft than his voice. <laughs> but it sounds like the message between the two of them came across pretty clearly what was the kids were expected to do. Oh yeah. 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 Now I'm going to go back. Mm -hmm. I, I was meaning to ask you this question. You're describing the house. Two bedrooms, one for the parents, and a bedroom for all nine kids? How do we do this now? <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of a pallet? <laughs> yeah. It's a nice padded quilt that you put on the floor. But um, let's see. We had a bed for the boys, but we, we learned how to sleep military style. One with the feet, your head up this way, the feet down this way. Um, but I tell you this, all nine of us did not really grow up under those conditions because the youngest ones came after her by the time my younger three sisters were born, we were a little bit more upgraded, which meant that we now had a dining room and my bed was in the dining room. What used, my bed, even though we had a table in there, my bed was there and uh, another sister. And then we had another room that had sister a bed, but our bedrooms were bigger than most people would think that a bedroom would be. They were pretty large. They could hold at least two double beds. Oh, yeah. And we didn't have a closet and dressers and all those things to take up the room. <laughs> so Wash day must have been quite a challenge for your mom. It was because it was in the galvanized tub with a washboard. And she did most of that. And uh, she would do the washing and then she would call one of us to do some rinsing. But sometimes it would take two of us to rinse the sheet so she'd get tired of you and she'd rinse it herself. But then our job was to go hang it outside, which was okay in the summer, but in the winter it would be pretty cold out there, so. They would get freezing in Birmingham? It would freeze, yeah. Oh, you don't linger outside very long then. No, no. And then we had a cow, so sometimes you'd have to get out there and get it before the, if the cow got loose, she would chew up the clothes. Oh. So we'd have to really kind of watch it. But in the summer, when you hang out something, it got dry pretty quickly, so we would get it before the cow would get a hold of it. Did some of the older kids 
give the three youngest girls a little hard time, but oh, you got it easy. You have no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I was the middle one, so I was always caught. It was like the three over there and the three over there. But it was the, my oldest sister was pretty much the disciplinarian for us. So even though she's about six years older than I, we knew that if she said something, you had to obey, especially if the mother wasn't home, that we just didn't give each other any trouble. So, Looking back at this childhood, would you say you had a good childhood growing up? I think so. I, I had a good childhood, but I had to look back over it. Because some of those days when I was getting a switch and, and Mother said it well, it's hurting her more than it hurts me, I did not understand it. And half the time it was because I'm not doing what she told me to do and it's the second time around. And that's pretty much the most you had. Or one of the church members said we were chewing gum in church and we didn't give it up to the usher. So we would get a spanking about that. But Did the family have a radio in the house? We had a radio, and that was our fun, yeah. Remember what shows you listened to? Well, we listened mostly to what my mother wanted to listen to, and Boston Blackie was one of them. And Dragnet. So we would listen to those, and it was interesting. Because you can almost tell what color something was somebody was wearing. And by the sounds, you could tell whether it was winter or summer. Did so. your mother listen to any soap operas? I don't think she listened to the soap operas on radio. But when we finally caught up with the rest of the neighborhood and got a television, she would do that. How old were you then? Who must have been about 10. Did you sometimes want to go over to the neighbor's house so you could watch the TV? Oh, we did. The first one who got the TV was um, down the block. And uh, they would allow the neighborhood kids to come in, but they would charge us a nickel. <laughs> so we would do whatever it took to get that nickel, and uh, we would go and watch TV. Any, it stayed on till about 10 o'clock at night. Any shows that you remember, especially those early years? The Lone Ranger and uh, Dale Rogers and Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever wonder? And then the you're... little the little rascals. Ah. Now that was one we could watch on Saturday. I was just going to say, ever mm -hmm. wonder why there's no black people in any of these TV shows? But the little rascals did have a African American character in it. What was his name? Spanky? No, Alfalfa was the little white one. Yeah, with the spiked hair, I think. Yeah. 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 Let's uh, let's talk about school then. You'd already talked about that a little bit. It sounds like you're going to public schools, and am I correct? These are always segregated schools you're going to. Yes. Uh, you remember anything special about grade school? Well, when I started the grade school, it was still in the original private school building. And uh, it was called Carrie A. Toggle Elementary School. And that person had run a boarding school before. And uh, some of the bedding and all that was still in there. It was said that Ms. Toggle uh, died in there. So that would be enough to keep kids from running up and down the hallways and stuff like that. Because, you know, if you go upstairs, Ms. Toggle spirit will get you and uh she was buried on the school ground and um i don't exactly recall when they built the new school but i went from fifth grade to eighth grade in a new building and so it was built i graduated in 1958 from grade school as as an eighth grader yes Yes. Did they have a ceremony? Oh, yes. We graduated. Um, that was a big deal. Um, expensive, too, according to our parents. 
we would wear a little red and white ribbon that was our school colors. So when you were ready for graduation, you get your little red and white ribbon about two weeks before and you wear that little ribbon everywhere you go, church, neighborhood and everything and everybody would congratulate you. But then uh, the girls all wore the same dress and one of our neighbors worked at Burger Phillips and that seems the teachers would always go to that store and pick out the fabric, which was extremely, ex well, to my mother, it was extremely expensive because when she had to make somebody's graduation dress, that took up a large part of the income. Your mom's making everybody's clothes then when you're growing up? Oh, my mother would get a piece of newspaper and see something in it, and she'd cut out that pattern, and she would lay it out, and she would make that dress. Mm -hmm. She made, and she would not allow the girls to wear them until she finished all of them. So that would be four girls waiting for a dress. <laughs> <laughs> and so once we get it, and when she would make mine, I would go and change it a little bit. And she, she didn't like that, but that was... Um, you went out, you did it yourself? You made some alterations yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had a sewing machine that she had to pedal. It was not electric. You had to pedal it with your foot. And so sometimes when she would get tired of pedaling, she would give it to me. But I was sewing and making clothes for the neighborhood kids by the time I was 10. So, Her mother sounds like quite the seamstress then. We didn't think so because all our classmates had store-bought clothes and ours was we call homemade clothes. But yes, yeah, she was because she could make her own patterns and she making trousers for the boys even? No, no. She would buy them three pairs of overalls for the year. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, yeah. So they get a new shirt. No, they got their that was one of the things we would fight about because they got the have store bought clothes and the girls had to wear homemade clothes but I don't remember a store bought dress before I was 12. Mm. Now let's go back to the yeah. schools then. Uh, it is segregated school. Um, were all of the teachers African-American? Yes. What you think of the quality of the teachers you had and the education you got? When I went to college, and after I started teaching college, I find that the quality of our education was probably better than a lot of kids. Um, even though we were in the South, our teachers did not allow us to speak as our white neighbors or the people that we encountered. We could not speak with that dot, uh, Southern drawl because she would, they would always say, well, what would Mr. Webster say? And if you said it in the wrong way, they, you've got a good dictionary lesson that you'd have to go and look it up and look for the punctuations there. And that's the way you had to speak. Um, if you had a writing class, the English teacher would follow you into the gym if you had to write something in the gym, she would make sure that it was written according to the way she had taught it in the English class. So you didn't get away with learning something here and forgetting it over there. Um, reading, I would say that was my worst, was reading and reading comprehension, but we always made the scores on the standardized tests, so that was not a big deal to us. Would books and magazines and newspapers been a luxury for you at home? Oh, newspaper, no. We got the newspaper every single day. Um, books, we had an aunt who worked on the trailway bus, and so she would always bring in the magazines and the National Geographics and things like that that she would pick up on the on the bus. And then when the Ebony magazine came out, Ebony and Jet, um, that aunt would always find one somewhere with for, for us and we kept up with it that way. Um, but in the home, we had what we were supposed to have. 
um, when it came to buying books, if we, when we got to a point where you, some of the stores were selling the books, we would just save up our lunch money and buy up books for school. Okay. What was I going to ask you? About? There was no library. The there library, was no library? The library came when I was about, I'd say I must have been close to the fourth grade because the they, they, Birmingham had a public library, but we couldn't use it or so. And I think about 1962, we could go in there, we could sit down and we could read it, but we couldn't check it out. So. Okay. What did your parents, what messages were the, the parents sending to the kids about the value of education? Was that something important to them? Oh yeah. My dad said, when you get it in your head, nobody can take it out. <laughs> so he was, he had a seventh grade education and he made sure, no, he was fifth. My mother was seventh, but he was insistent that we had to learn enough to teach him and my mother what we knew, but he, he wasn't, didn't make us sit down and teach him, but we had to stay in school. That was no question about that. Well, but there was nothing would, else to do anyway. A lot of kids would drop out after the eighth grade? Oh, no, no. I mean, you're... Not in my neighborhood. Okay. Oh, no. There was 800 kids that graduated from grade school with me, and I think that must have been about 825 that started in that class. No, you weren't allowed to drop out of school. In fact, there was a person in the neighborhood. You could go, drop out at age 16 if you wanted to, but most kids who dropped out of school had been kind of delinquent before that. But that was this lady called Miss McQueen, and she was called the truant officer. And she went to the church where my parents went. So all you would hear if anybody didn't go to school and they weren't sick, Miss McQueen would show up at your house and threaten to take your parents to jail. So nobody wanted the parents to go to jail. So we pretty much went to school. Well, let's get you into high school then. Because mm -hmm. you had this big graduation ceremony that somewhat expensive, at least your folks thought so. Where did yeah. you go to high school? I went to A.H. Parker High School, which was also historical for black people. It was the largest high school, I think, in the country at one point because it was the only one to serve our particular area. Was the building pretty well run down? By the time I got there, it was. Yeah. But it was, um, we started out with what the ninth grade was called the Annex, which was some little wooden buildings that were about eight blocks away from the main building. So you got to go there. All the ninth graders went there. And then when you went to the main building, I think it was pretty much set up. We had industrial education from seventh and eighth grade. So when you got to high school, you had some more of that. We had, um, if you ever heard of the Tuxedo Junction, Fess Wallace, he was the band leader at the school there. We had a renowned band football team and the bands were good. We had auto mechanics, we had industrial, what they call industrial, woodworking, uh, we had sewing, typing, um, most of those things for the girls, but they, they were pretty much set up. If you're going to go to college, you got to take these courses. If you're not going to go to college, we're preparing you for business school. And so... I think, as far as I know, we had pretty much everything we needed. Um, the We had foreign languages. I took French when I was in there, French and Spanish and those kinds of... So yeah. I think we were pretty okay. Again, the, all of, were all the teachers black? Yes, high school. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm kind of surprised the emphasis of going to college. Well... 
The only if you didn't go to college when you were 18, you either worked in a restaurant, one of the two hotels that was there, or you worked in white people's houses. And you're talking about as a girl, in one of the, for the girls. Well, the boys either push lawn and they cut lawn. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't want to do that, you better go to college. <laughs> So most of, we had a pretty good college rate because we wanted out of there. And uh, when it came to the boys, they were, if they weren't what they call college material, they would prepare themselves for the military. But a lot of the courses you're talking about, they're trade kind of courses, teaching well, them they particular had, skills too. Well, you had to have that in addition to everything else, okay. just in case. Because if you're going to get married to anybody, you at least needed to know how to cook and clean a house. Mm -hmm. So they would teach you those things in school. When you go to college, you need to know how to take care of yourself when you're there. So they had the pretty much classes that would prepare you for both. You graduated what year? I graduated from high school in 1962. Were there still plenty of jobs in the steel mills? and the foundries around town at that time for the kids? Not really. One of my brothers did start working there, but there weren't that many jobs. Were you a good student? I was number three out of the 500 that graduated with me, yes. You were an outstanding student then, Connie. Yes, but I wasn't valedictorian or salutatorian. <laughs> you sound like, oh darn, I didn't quite make the cut. No. How about the rest of the, the kids in the family? They weren't that good. My youngest, my older brother, the brother that was over me, uh, we would have lots of fights because the teacher would actually bring him into the classroom or take me into his classroom to show that I was smarter than he. And so we'd have a fight at home. You know, I yeah. don't know that I can blame yeah. him for that. Yeah. And then the youngest brother, uh, he was in the heart of the civil rights movement. He didn't particularly like school either because he didn't. I think they were beginning to catch on with what was going on in the city. And our, because our parents weren't um, that educated, we didn't get a whole lot of help at home. We just got to, we've got to sit down and do this homework. And I was a little bit more intent than the other ones. Uh, my two sisters ahead of me, uh, one of them was one of the few kids who got pregnant before she graduated from high school. She did graduate, though, because they didn't find out until she graduated. And the other one actually started junior college. And... Uh, when she found out that there wasn't going to be a lot for her to do uh, when she graduated, except because she, that was junior college, she wasn't going to be able to teach in the schools because she still needed a baccalaureate degree. She stopped and she, well, she got pregnant too. And I got punished for her getting pregnant, but. <laughs> I was going to ask what your, your parents, especially your mom's reaction to her daughter is getting pregnant like that. Oh. My daddy was one that was really hard. Um, I think my oldest sister actually got a strapping because she got pregnant. And uh, the other one didn't tell them. She went, she snuck off and went to my grandmother's house. And when they found out that she wasn't home, then that became a big deal. And my dad acted, acted as if I had also gotten pregnant, so he was almost not going to let me out of his sight. And uh, in fact, even that man who was taking us to church, he didn't want him to take us to church anymore because he was afraid that he might have had something to do with it, but it wasn't. But anyway, my daddy claimed the children. There's only going to be one woman in the house. So my two nephews grew up as my parents child even when my sister stopped college and went away uh, they would not let that child go with her 
it sounds like you were pretty determined all the way through high school that you were getting to college. Yeah. yeah. I think the teachers had put it up to, we had pretty good counselor in the school. So they would almost point you out and tell you what you're going to do, you know. You are college bound. You will go. And they would actually put you in a class where students were seemingly a little bit more accelerated than others. And they would just drill the whole class that that's what you're going to do. Hmm. So we didn't have any choice. What so we, we our biggest thing was who's going to pay for this? <laughs> <laughs> now we'll get to that. <laughs> what were your favorite classes? All of mine were favorite. English was pretty much the easiest for me. Well, I thought um, you said you had some problems with reading, though. I did. But English, and the, I may have had problems reading, but I usually got done what I had to do because I would just take time to do it, and I still do. I got through all of school without speed reading, but I just would read more, even through graduate school, like drink coffee and just take longer to do it. And my daddy would have to chase me to bed at night because I would still be at it. And then when we would go, I was interested, but when it came, that was my lowest score on the standardized test. Hey, maybe so. some of your other siblings would have been happy with that score. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we would have, even when they built that library in the neighborhood, uh, it wasn't exactly in the neighborhood. It was about six miles away, but you walked to it. Um, we would always have contests at the when school's out. You'd have to read so many books, and then you'd have to give a little report back. You'd give it to the librarian, and the librarian would turn it over to the school when school was back over. So it was pretty mandatory that you read whether you wanted to or whether you thought you could do it fast or not. So, But it sounds like you wanted to be reading anyway. Yeah, I did. Yeah. What did you think you wanted to do beyond college as far as a career? Did you know when you were in high school? Mm -hmm. I had wanted to be a veterinarian, but my folks, there was a five-year program at the school where I was going to go. And uh, my dad said, don't have four years. You don't have, you only have four years to go. So, but at our school, we had the Future Nurses Club of America. And we also had a, the school nurse was in charge of that. And the nursing, the future nurses club, we took care of the football players. Uh, whenever there was a disaster in the neighborhood, we took care of them. And so we were pretty much groomed from there. That's what you're going to do. So if you're going to be in nursing, then you've got to take all the courses for college. Well, it's not a bad way to meet some of the football players, then, is it? Well, they'd be injured until so they'd be balling like babies, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you work while you are going through high school? No. They had a program called Diversified Education, but I was not qualified because I was one of those students with the good academic grades. So I could not be in there. And toward the end of high school, I asked to be in that. And they allowed me to, but I applied for a job. And it was supposed to be as a short order cook in the some cafeteria. But I had no experience, so I didn't get the job. Did you get involved with any extracurricular activities at school? The nursing? program. Yeah. We dabbled in some things, but if anything costs money, then we didn't get involved in it. Like the Girl Scouts, I would go to their meetings, but I couldn't get the uniform because we couldn't afford it. And so you can only go so far in that because when they did their little stuff with the uniforms, I didn't have one, so I couldn't. And then the band, I did, um, I was in grade school. I learned to play the trumpet. But then when I got to high school, I couldn't keep it up because I couldn't afford the band uniform. So I dropped out. I 
think I know the answer to this, but were mm -hmm. there any sports available for the girls? No. Title IX had not kicked in yet. <laughs> that's, a, that's a decade off in the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how about theater or anything like that? I participated in that uh, because one of the teachers told me, you look like a French model. So I was in two of the school plays. And so, let's see, one of them was called Antigone. I can't remember the other one. But I, I was in two of the school plays. So, okay. And that was a big deal. And I think that was really big because then your parents get to come and it was everybody came and they saw and it was you practiced and you made uh, friends and it just so happened that the drama teacher was also one of our counselors so when i got to college i was still in drama yeah connie i'm going to mm -hmm. shift gears on you here okay because you've been very good but about avoiding this because I asked you to, but now I want to talk about what was going on in, in the world and especially Birmingham, Alabama with the civil rights movement and walk you through. And I, you know, some of these things you might ha have no memory of at all, but I know you've got some important stories in this regard as well. So you were 10 years old in 1954 when Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court case came out. Was there ever a time when you were in the Birmingham school system that there was enforced busing, integration of the schools? Oh, no. They didn't want you to go to those other schools. You mean they didn't want you? Your parents didn't want you to go to the schools? or The, the school? city of Birmingham did not want you to go. In fact, um, when I was in high school, our high school was, well, we didn't know that it was overcrowded because it was the only one that was there, and they had two others. One was in another city. And that was another one in Birmingham. And um, I think they finally realized that graduating four and 500 students twice a year was a little bit much. So they built two more high schools. And uh, in 10th grade, our class got split up. Um, some went to Hayes and some went to, what was that other one? There was another one. They went to those two high schools that was closer to where they were. Uh, they needed to be bussed in. If they lived more than five miles away from school, then they they got bussed. If you lived five miles, you walked. So I was in the walking group. Uh, you continued to go to Parker through the whole time? Yeah. How far did you have to walk to school then? When I drive it, when I go to Birmingham, I show it to my children. It was about five and a half miles. And your children said? That was child abuse, Mom. <laughs> 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 because we had to go up a hill that was like this. And you had about 15 minutes to do what you got to do because Mother didn't think you were supposed to walk slow. You were supposed to briskly get to school. And well, that's what we did. Now, I've got a couple other here I think you might have been way too young to remember as well, but I'm going to just kind of go through this list. December of 1955, that's when Rosa Park refused to move to the back of the bus. And here you had this experience at three years old. That's already an important experience for you. Oh, we were around then. In fact, my mother was the town crier. She would sit on that front porch at 4 o'clock in the morning when somebody would tell them, because the, that generated what they called the Freedom Riders. No, the Freedom Riders came a little bit later. But when she did that bus, then we had the bus boycott. And so we would get together under Martin Luther King, and he called it silent protesting. And he'd meet with us at different churches, and he'd say, okay, this is the way we want you to go. And the children would line up with an adult, but we would go two by two. And so you would just, we boycotted the bus, but we also demonstrated in some of the areas where we couldn't eat at the lunch counters and stuff like that. And so we just would go, some of us, the children would go like maybe if the parents who had boycotted the bus, if they were working a long distance at 
the white people's house, we would go and meet some of them and carry their loads home for them. Um, Sounds like it's going on even when you're a pretty young girl. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty safe when I was there so we could get around a little bit. You mentioned yeah. Martin Luther King. Uh, followed his career pretty closely? Yeah, yeah. Well, we kind of obeyed him pretty closely, but we didn't know that he was going to be who he was going to be. But he would come into the into Birmingham, especially after the lead in the bo bus bo boycotts. And we boycotted some of the five and 10 cent stores where they had a lunch counter in there and you couldn't sit down to buy anything. Uh, we, we boycotted those. And so we would just, he taught us how to do a march without saying anything to anybody. And he would call it peaceful demonstration. And um, when the civil rights, when the buses started coming from different places, people were coming uh, four o'clock in the morning, my mother would sit on the front porch and whack, wave down everybody and tell them the Freedom Riders are coming, the Freedom Riders are coming. And uh, by four o'clock in the afternoon, we'd all be down at 16th Street Baptist Church waiting to see if you can get in. And they would, we'd sell ice cream and things like that to put gas in the bus to send them on to Montgomery or wherever else they were going to go. but uh, Was that 1961? A part, well, it went from 55 to 61. It was pretty much most of my high school years. The uh, bus boycott, is, it sounds like it was in the earlier phase of that. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you remember this? The Supreme Court came out with the ruling that Authorine Lucy, I think I got the name right, had to be admitted to the University of Alabama. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what year was that? Um, well, the ruling came down in June, and then there was a big con or a, a standoff in February of 56. I was still in grade school because <laughs> I graduated from grade school in 58. But the authoring Lucy thing, when she went, she was going to go to the University of Alabama. And that's when the governor decided he was going to go and stand in the door, and she was not going to get in there. And I do remember some of my uh, brother's classmates had graduated, and they were in the National Guard. And it was Bobby Kennedy that federalized them. And then they went there and moved the governor, just told him he had to turn around. Well, that might be a different one because that, that had to put it in the 1960s. I know what you're talking about mm -hmm. there and there was another controversy then too. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about the... It was Arthur and Lucy, he wouldn't let her... It was, well, that was... They had to move somebody. Yeah, well the dates mm -hmm. I saw was 56. Your memory okay. is probably better than mine, but... Yeah. Um, Emmett Till, when Emmett Till was, was murdered, do you remember anything about that? I think I was about 10 then. Let's see. Yep. <laughs> We heard about it, and uh, people were rather protective, did not want the boys to go out, but the, what we had heard was that he was beat. There were some other hangings that went on around that time as well, but it was that he whistled at a white lady, and we were pretty much, because I think he's pretty much my age, and so we that put, put us on edge a, a, a little bit. And I think that's when my daddy got overprotective. He sat down with kids and explained <laughs> how things were going to be? You will be in this house when the sun goes down. <laughs> when the street lights come on, you will be in this house or on this front porch. Yep. Um, December 25th, 1956. Now, I was surprised reading about this. There was a series of bombings, and this is the Bethel Baptist Church's bomb. That was one of the first of many that was happening. Um, you remember anything? You would have been still just 12 years old at that time. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think if that was Reverend Woods' church. Um, one of my classmates' father was the minister. I think that was the Bethel, yeah. Well, this is Fred Shuttlesworth. I think that Shuttlesworth? was his church yeah. at the time. Fred Shuttlesworth 
Junior was in our class. He was one of those to get, <coughs> when they split up the schools, he went to one of the other schools, but he started out with me in ninth grade. And we talked, we started this part of the conversation with mentioning that the um, Supreme Court case, uh, Brown v. Board of Education came out in 1954, but 1957 is the Little Rock Nine, so nothing had happened, and they're enforcing the issue in Little Rock, Arkansas. Do you remember following that? We followed it, but it's like in your current events in class in the school, pretty much that's the way we covered it. But we didn't get too involved in it. We just knew what was going on, and we knew that things were happening there as well as in Birmingham. June 29th, 1958, now you're 14 years old, uh, Bethel Baptist Church is bombed again. And somewhere along the line, uh, we were talking about this before, it, Birmingham was renamed by some of the people in town. What was the new name, the nickname? Bombingham. Bombingham. That was because you could be the lawyer that would go to court for some of them was named uh, Arthur Shores. He lived in walk, well anyway, it was in walk, anything was in walking distance to us. We didn't know that five miles was a long way. But when they bombed his house, it actually shook us out of our beds from the distance that we were, which I'm sure I haven't clocked it to see exactly what it is, but it must be at least four miles away. And we just, I mean, it, it just kind of shook everything. They, who was they? Who did you understand at that time they were, the people? Ku Klux Klan. No doubt in your mind? No. No, we saw them half the time. <laughs> Wearing the outfits? Yeah. yeah. Got a scar here. <laughs> One was chasing me to get away, uh, to throw a cross on me. That's the thing that they would do. They just intimidate the neighborhood by throwing a cross on somebody. And I just happened to be out walking between a friend's house and mine. And I turned around and I ran between some hedges and a chain link fence. And I cut the arm. I still have the scar, but my mother didn't know that's what it was at the time. How old were you at that time? When How old was I? Yeah. Must have been about somewhere between 10 and 12. Yeah. Very young age. When you say yeah. they're throwing a cross, is this a big cross? What is this? It would be. It'd be on fire, so I guess I couldn't really tell what it was, but it was about this long, and then it was crossed. But they usually would have it already burning when they throw it out their window. And we would call them cowards because they would throw it and then they'd speed off. But What were you thinking? Here you are. Mom is making sure you're going to church every Sunday. Uh, I suspect that you believed in what you're hearing in church. And then you have something like that happen. How do you, how do you comprehend all of that as a young girl? A part, you know, when I think... Right about that time, Billy Graham came into Birmingham and they would have what they called tent meetings. And uh, I think we got to know God more and we got to pray more because we figured that was the only thing that we could do. Um, but the thing that was most annoying to us was that where the Ku Klux Klan's met most was at church. They were in a church. And they claimed that God told him to do what we, what they were doing. So we were very avid readers. We would be in that Bible trying to read it to see if we could find that because it was like, we haven't seen this in there yet. So why are they saying this? But um, they all called themselves Christians. Well, they didn't say they were Christians, but we knew that they were meeting at churches. That was early in Billy Graham's ministry powerful ministry. Do you remember anything about, was he addressing those kinds of things when he was coming to Birmingham, some of these other southern towns? I don't know if he was mentioning it as much in terms of what was going on as to say that we were God's children in red, yellow, black, or white. 
you are God's child. And we had a little song that we used to sing in school too, in grade school. Um, Jesus loved the little children of the world, red or yellow, black or white. We are precious in his sight. So we would just kind of go through and convince yourselves that that was the truth. And so that's pretty much, I think, for me, that's how we made it through because we realized that something is the matter with them, but I am precious. But at the same time, I think they were telling us that when we would get the benefits of that would be in the sweet by and by. So we didn't think it was going to happen in our lifetime. <laughs> You had to die in order to really get the benefits. And yet, sounds like you were involved in the movement, in the early civil rights movement, fighting for things to change. You didn't have a whole lot of choice. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to a couple more things. It was February 1960, and this is just, there was a whole series of these, but that's really kind of the beginning of the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins, and that went on for quite a bit of time. I suspect you're hearing about that as well. Mm -hmm. And then in 1961 is when you have, at least my understanding, just doing some quick homework for this, that's the first real year of the, the Freedom Riders. And they started in Washington, D.C., a group of about 12 or 13, both black and white, deliberately going through, riding, what, Greyhound buses and... They weren't Greyhound. They were some kind of chartered bus. Yeah, but they had to stop at the Greyhound bus stop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Going through the South. Uh, so you're going through Virginia, the Carolinas, and then they got into Alabama. And I guess they got to Anniston, Alabama on May 14th, and things got very ugly. Do you remember anything hearing about that? Because the next stop is Birmingham. Well, we probably heard about it. Uh, and I think that's when what stimulated some of that, I think, was the fact that in those little marches that we were having, the police had started using dogs and to chase the children and turning the fire hoses on us. And I think somehow or the other that was getting on TV. And so the people around the United States were seeing that and that prompted them to come to the South to help and to show their solidarity. And on that, uh, some white people were on, in those buses as well, so. Do you remember, were you personally involved when the, the Freedom Riders actually got to Birmingham and that was, just a couple of days later, May 17th. And again, my reading was, this is after the bus they had been on had been stopped and confronted by angry mobs and Ku Klux Klan and actually been firebombed and burned and they had to get a different bus and a different group of Freedom Riders to come to Birmingham. Do you remember I don't know about all the changes, but we do know that it was fired. Um, and when they got into Birmingham, I think, I wanted to participate in the marches, and by that time, my daddy didn't want us to participate. But I got caught when they got into the Greyhound bus station. My friend and I had saved up our little money, and we went to downtown to buy something, and that's where our bus changed. And when we got there, they kind of pushed us. They were just pushing people into the paddy wagons. Paddy wagons is the police, a big truck. Who's they? The police, the police. Birmingham police. Right, yeah, they push you into this thing and then they come back and put your name down. But while they were out there trying to put some, get some more people to push up in there, some of us got out and we, we knew how to get home by running through the graveyard. So we went, that's about as, I think we probably would have won a, Prize if somebody had seen us running because <laughs> we got home because our, my friend and I knew that my mother had given us strict rules. We were not to take the bus home from school, and we did that day, and so we knew we had to get out of there. So you weren't intending to get 
involved with this protest. No, we didn't even know the bus was going to be coming to that spot at that time. But the police was there just rounding up people. Um, some of the people might might have known, but it may have happened while we were in school that the announcement came. But usually when some when they were coming in, if they were going to be coming anywhere near my house, my mother would know that they were coming. So she'd be the one that flagging down all the workers going to work to tell them that it's going to happen. And um, so we didn't know, the two of us anyway, my friend and I didn't know that the buses were, in fact, I don't think we even knew that they were changing over at the Greyhound station. And we just got caught in the, we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, but we knew we had to get out of there and get home. So that's what we did. How old were you at that time? Must have been 13, 14. So. Your heart must have been racing when you got pushed into that paddy wagon. We did. Yeah, it was. It was racing then. But it wasn't about what they were going to do to us. It was about <laughs> what my mother was going to do to us. So I take it, <laughs> honey, you went straight home and told your mom what happened? No, my mother found out about 15 years later, maybe 20. What she say when she found out? Well, my friend told her, and uh, she she had when I got home, she she was kind of arthritic at that time, and she had a cane, and she went to hit me with that cane. I said, "What are you doing here?" And she says, "You getting a whipping?" I said, "What am I getting a whipping for?" Betty told me where you all were, and I thought, "Oh," she says, "I whipped her, and you're gonna get a whipping." So I mean, it was like just pretend whipping, you know, but she was going to get us. And so that's when we had to fess up. That's what we had done. Kind of your mother sounds like a remarkable lady. We thought she was just mean, but, <laughs> <laughs> but as we got older, we realized she was. <laughs> you began to appreciate her more then? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Especially when she didn't really hit me hard with that stick. <laughs> Many years after the event. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the more infamous people in the whole civil rights movement is from Birmingham himself, and he's in charge of the police department, right? Bull Connor? Bull Connor. Eugene yeah. Bull Connor? Yeah. Is that somebody that the family would have talked about at home? You just scared of them, that's all. And you just did not go anywhere near City Hall. If you had to go up in there, you don't you drink water before you leave home and drink it after you get there because he might have changed the sign and put white only at all of the water fountains so you didn't get, they had color and then they had white. But he just might have go and slap up a sign on both of them. So we didn't spend too much time down there. So it sounds like it's not just the KKK that's tormenting you. It's the police are complicit with this whole thing as well. We thought he was KKK himself. Yeah, so they were just doing extra work and he had the office. I don't know if anybody ever tried to show that he was KKK or not, but we always thought he was. You mentioned when you were arrested that they were writing your names down. Did, your, did it ever show up officially in arrest records that you know of? Um, I don't think they got mine and my friends because we got out of there before they took the names down. But for the rest of the people that we left in that bus, we knew what who was in there. But I don't remember what year it was, but it, it had to be before we went to college because most of my classmates, some of them were in there and their names got written down, but they ended up at college. But the ACLU came and they expunged the record. They made them take our names off of the record. And that's when we learned in our government class that that was a felony to have been arrested at that point. And so we learned the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor and that we didn't want to be involved in any more of them and what that meant to us because we would not have been able to go to college or be in the military or 
anything like that. What was the crime? If it's a felony, what was the felony? Marching without a permit. But doesn't sound even like your friends were marching. They just happened <laughs> to be in the, the bus terminal. Some of them were marching, though. Some of them were marching. And we just ended up there. Um, we weren't, the, the friend and I, we were just trying to change buses, and we ended up where the marching was. Uh, they were there to greet the bus, probably. But that would happen all the time. I mean, it was anywhere they would see a crowd of people, they would just shove you up into the into the paddy wagon and you would be arrested and you might end up going to the jail with Martin Luther King and the rest of them. Did you have a chance personally to meet Dr. King? I did. You remember did. the incident? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, my All the churches, 16th Street I guess was the biggest church around. <laughs> when we look at it now we were thinking, Ours must have been awfully tiny because that church wasn't real big anyway. It had a basement and it had the sanctuary. So the other churches around would do things to help to send the Freedom Riders on to the next stop. So my church was selling ice cream. And we made homemade ice cream. You Somebody mix it up and use freeze and freeze and freeze and freeze. And then you would get it hard enough to stick into an ice cream cone. And uh, when Martin Luther King came, he he wanted he said to me personally, "Girl, give me a, one a, a cone of that cream." And it was, I think we were selling it for a nickel. And he gave me fifteen cents, and I tried to give him back his change, and he wouldn't take the change. But one of our neighbors took the picture. I wish we had that picture because. I cried a lot over that picture, but it had me with braids sticking out <laughs> both sides. But he took that picture with me and Martin Luther King, and I, we saw it then, but we didn't think anything of it except that my braids were sticking out. <laughs> How old were you then? I must have been 10, 12, 13. Did you know this is a very important guy? No, no. All we knew it was this young preacher we knew he, he was, and we knew he was a good orator. And so a lot of people just wanted to get in just to hear him orate. But we also wanted to get there so we can get to understand why he wanted us to just keep on walking and not say anything. So it was always a silent, silent protest. The nonviolent resistance. Right. Even at 10 years old, you're getting that kind of instruction? Whenever it was. I can't remember exactly how old I was throughout the whole scenario because it all went through my first year in college even. But, uh, yeah. Now it's quite a few years. But a later. lot of the kids would go with their parents. But um, and that's when, you know, they didn't care who was in the in the march, they would just turn dogs loose on you and mm -hmm. water hoses and things like that. And that's when the people, I think the sympathy came when they saw that they were doing it to children. And I'm going to bring that up again. But as I understand, that was happening by the time you were already in college. So, No, that was, I went to college in 1962. And again, just taking a look at it, I think that was... 63 is when King came back to Birmingham and was trying to lead some more protests, and that's when lots of the pictures of the dogs and the fire hoses were going on. Well, there are a lot of things that happened that didn't get always publicized, and he had been there many times before that because it was like he was just some little preacher who was coming up and, you know... We, we call it extemporaneously speaking. And so we, we like that because that was a speech class. And, you know, we, we wanted to be like that too. So, but he had been to Birmingham several times before that, but I think it heated up. It just got mm -hmm. worse and worse. So it was most of that, as far as I know, yeah. it went from the 50s all the way up 
through 60s. And it's not uncommon at all for the combat veterans or you growing up, all these incidents kind of get blurred together and it's almost impossible to, to differentiate because you're, you're paying attention to your own life, not trying to figure out what the dates are. I want to show you a couple pictures and just kind of get your reaction because these are some of the pictures you're talking about. And the mm -hmm. first couple there are fire hoses. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned yourself, when those pictures get seen on TV mm -hmm. and in major newspapers all across the country, then that has a pretty powerful impact on the rest of the country. Something's got to change. Yeah, we were glad they came, but then we always felt sorry that somebody had come from the north and got killed down there too. So that was that was hard to deal with, you know, that the people came to help and they got killed. But when those kind of pictures, some of those are in the Civil Rights Museum in Birmingham. And some of my classmates could walk through there and they could tell you whose parent that was. No. Yeah, so. Has an awful lot of meaning for them then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we knew quite a few. But because I went off to college, in fact, I had been to college before I graduated from high school as well. And so I missed some of the things that some of them experienced. I was ele in the 11th grade and I went to college for the summer. What college? Tuskegee. And Tuskegee, I know, is in Tuskegee, Alabama. How far away is that from Birmingham? It's about three hour bus ride. Bus ride? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Connie, where were you sitting on the bus when you went to Tuskegee? Most of the time when we went on the bus, we had chartered a bus that we were able to call Greyhound and tell them that so many students from Tuskegee wanted to go to Birmingham. And a couple times we asked for that bus specifically, but when it came out of Columbus, Georgia, it would already be full. So we might have missed the bus, even though we asked for it. One time they did send one to the campus but otherwise we'd have to go to a mobile station to pick it up. And Are you saying that the bus was chartered again. so that it would be entirely African-Americans on the bus then? It, yeah, yeah. And that was considered to be the safe way of doing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, you were always confronted with the facts of life in that respect. Yes. And I think the administration at Tuskegee would help with that too. They would actually help us to get the bus, you know, because they knew so many of us were going to Birmingham and they didn't want us to be, have to be encountered with whether we were gonna be sitting in the wrong place on the bus. Yeah. So, but even mm -hmm. with the, Oh, you don't want me to get ahead of you. No, go ahead. <laughs> one, the most traumatic thing that happened to us was on one of those buses that was bringing students. We either had you going from Birmingham to Tuskegee or they were coming from Columbus, Georgia, or Atlanta. They were, you know, we had students that Georgia and Florida and Birmingham would be the ones of us who'd taken the bus most of the time. One of our students... One of our classmates was shot at the gas station because he asked to use the bathroom. And to my knowledge, the person who killed him was declared innocent. Did you see that happen? It was on the bus just be, just after mine. It was the after mine. I had, my bus had already gone by. It was after that. No, so we didn't see it. Just, I didn't see it, but the rest of my classmates who were on the bus saw it. But just hearing the news, I'm sure that had a powerful impact on you when you heard the news. Well, it tore up the whole campus, and we then ended up getting into trouble with the administration at the school because all of us decided that we were going to have our own protest. 
and we organized on the campus and we were going to march back down to the gas station. And if we had gone there, all of us were going to flunk whatever courses we were in. And that was to be our punishment. So knowing that I only had four years in school because my sisters were behind me, I didn't go. <laughs> this was but the we march went to the gas station where the murder actually happened? Yeah, we were going to do that. Yeah. Some of the students were from Chicago and places like that, so they were a little bit more brave than the rest of us. And I think it might have been most of them who had actually convinced the rest of us that we should do this march. But I was on the campus, and uh, that must have been about 400 students going down. And you say it was the administration who, who didn't want you to do this? Administration didn't want us to do anything. They didn't want, they considered themselves our parents when we were away from home. And I'm assuming the administration is entirely black as well. Yes. But they had all been raised in the, in the South themselves. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think most of them had. Um, but when I went there, when I went to college, you did not ride in a car. <laughs> Girls, did, girls especially, did not ride in a car. Because? Well, the reason they gave us was that some students before I went to college had been in a car and they got killed or that was some accident, so they weren't going to have that. An, an accident or something? An accident. Okay. It was an accident. But when your parents brought you to school, if you went in a car then, that would be the last time you would be in a car until the parents came back and picked you up. That anywhere we wanted to go, it wasn't too much to do there anyway. Because our hospital was on campus and I was in nursing, so we just walked to where you had to go. If you had any money, you could go on what we called the block. It was a drugstore and a restaurant. There were two restaurants down there. And if you got in a car, otherwise you were going to do something you had no business doing anyway, they thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we just just didn't do it. <laughs> and then when in our senior year, we could ride in a car. Your administration was more protective than your parents almost. They were. They they... were. <laughs> <laughs> and would they, would they hesitate to pick up the phone and call the parents if there was an issue going on? Oh, they did. My freshman roommate got sent home. Oh, yeah. What what caused that? Do you remember? She went into the boys' dorm. Oh, yeah, yeah. She got put out of school. Okay, so you had already had some classes Tuskegee before you got there in the fall of '62. Is that right? They weren't exactly college classes. What we what they had it was called the National Science Foundation. Summer Institute for High Ability High School Students and Their Teachers. I should have mentioned this before. What is your actual name? Constance Louise Love Edwards. And how often did you hear Constance when you were growing up? Only when, oh, my, my classmates called me Constance and the teacher because you always call each other proper names in school. But from my family, the only time I heard it was when my parents, when I was in trouble. So if my mother would, my dad, I can't remember at all my daddy calling me Constance. But if my mother called me Constance, I knew I was in big trouble. And if she called me Constance Louise, I think I was probably going to get grounded as well. <laughs> so that's, it's that's it. your mother and your daddy. Uh -huh. That's how you refer to him. Yeah. Did you have a different kind of relationship with your father then? That a little bit. The way my daddy described it was, no matter what he did, if I needed something from him or wanted something from him, if he was going off on one of his spills or whatever, I would just sit and look at him and say, "Now are you finished?" And I would ask for whatever it was that I'd asked for before. And my sisters felt a little jealous about that because I could get what I wanted. 
But my daddy said it was because I would just sit there and look at him, and when he's finished, I'd ask again. So, but they would never, I think they would get, had my sisters and my brother had the tendency to get angry if they asked a favor and they didn't get it. And they, he does, he said, no, that's it. Mm -hmm. But I'd say, I want it, I need it, whatever it is. Because usually we didn't ask for anything we didn't need. Um, but most of the time when he was say no, it was when you wanted to go someplace. And if he tell me, no, I can't go someplace, then I wanted to know why. But my brother, he didn't care why. He just, he said, he just get angry. Hmm. But I would want to know why. It so often happens, Connie, when we take a break or after the session's over, then you hear all these other interesting <laughs> comments that were made. So I want to backtrack a little bit before I get you back to Tuskegee. And let's start with a, a more of a conversation about what kind of training were you getting when you're in these classes with Martin Luther King and others? What were you being told? We were just told that in that we deserved more than what we were getting. That if you had money and you wanted to buy a 15 cents hot dog, you should be able to get the hot dog and sit down and eat it. And we shouldn't get it thrown in a paper bag and you had to walk and eat it on the street. Um, we were needed to be able to use libraries and to have decent school books. And we were just marching for that. And then at some point, it, we were also marching for the garbage truck workers because a black man could not drive the truck. All he could do was pick up the garbage and throw it in. And a white man was driving the truck and the salaries weren't keeping up. Um, I do remember my father and his, that thing he was involved with, I see that they put down, it was settled in 1973, but it had started in the 20s. Um, he was making $4,000 when I, I remember my college application it was $4,000 a year. So yeah, we had eight kids on $4,000 a year. <laughs> stretching 4000 a long way. Yeah, yeah. How about the, what were you being told in terms of how you were supposed to conduct yourselves when you're involved with these marches and protests? We have been convinced that the people who did not want us to have were the ones who were wrong and that the government was behind all of that. But in order to get them to, we were going, you can convince somebody by being nice and that's what we were supposed to be doing. And if you, let's see, if you throw fire onto a fire, it's just gonna burn more. But if you don't have anything for them to throw fire into, what they were telling us is we don't throw back because they will throw. So we were told that people may say things to you and they may throw things at you. But I think most of what actually happened was through the earlier parts was what they said rather than them throwing things. I don't remember too much of the anti-protesters throwing things at us. It was usually just what they would say. But again, what were you expected? If somebody did start yelling at you, what were you expected to do in return? Just keep on walking, don't say anything. It was a nonviolent movement and it was drilled into us what nonviolence meant. And words can produce more violence from the other side, so you don't say anything to them. We sang songs, but we were singing pretty much to the Lord. And so, and for our protection, I know more about that now than I did then. You know, you can whip the devil real good, 
just by praising the Lord. And we were, that's, and I don't recall them telling us that then, but it was just, he was a young 30 some year old person and here we are teenagers. So as far as we were concerned, whatever he said, that was it. But it wasn't so much that it was his age or his preaching, but he was just saying, we're gonna have to have a protest and this is the way it's going to be. It's never been this way before. Did his tactics, these tactics of nonviolence, did they make sense to you? Oh, they made sense. Do you think? I that... mean, we had brothers and sisters, so you hit them. Well, if they hit you, you hit them back. You'd be having a fight going on for a while. So we just, I mean, that was pretty common for us. I mean, we, we knew that, that if you participated, if somebody invited you to a fight, it wasn't going to be a fight if you didn't give them back something. So it just didn't. Okay. How about the incident about, uh, you mentioned when we were off camera here about a nephew that was actually shot. That was my nephew's uh, cousin, but it was a relative of his wife. He was actually shot during the one of the marches. And uh, most of the time that I knew him was after he had been shot. He eventually died from that wound. You remember the particulars of that incident? No, we just realized that he was, he always walked with a limp. And we knew some other people who had gotten shot in the back and they were paralyzed for life, but we thought he was in pretty good shape because he could at least walk without the aid of anything. But I don't know exactly what killed him, but whatever it was, was related to the the shot. But he was in his 30s when he died. This is uh, All of this is an awful lot for a young girl to be trying to comprehend. And I guess I'm wondering, in the moments, were there points when you're just really scared or were you kind of operating on emotions? We were most scared when the bombs when the bombs went off because, I mean, you could feel it. I mean, it was like, when are they going to hit this house? And like I told you, my little house was not very sturdy. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we learned before that it was pretty good because it withstood all the hurricanes that came through. But we always thought that they would just go around and just start bombing. And that was what had happened. And I think... Right about that time, too, was when people were building, we call them air raid shelters. And there was this nuclear threat and all this, and we didn't have one. So we were always thinking if something like that happened, we didn't have a hole to go into. So we just figured. Yeah, I read someplace that during this time frame we've been talking about, there was something like 45 bombings in the Birmingham area. Probably all in the same week, too. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a lot to deal with. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned going on these marches and singing songs. There's a couple of very famous songs that everybody can recognize today. You remember any of the songs that you were singing? Keep on walking. I don't know. Um, I remember Amen. We sung that a lot. Uh I'm marching up the King's Highway. And that's what we would think a lot of times. We, Whenever we were marching, we were going up the King's Highway. The King as in God's Highway? God, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, How about We Shall Overcome? Oh, We Shall Overcome. And that was the big one. And that was, I think that one insulted the police more than anything else because we would lock hands and they would try to break hands and we would just hold through and that's when a lot of us would fall on the ground and because they would, he says, whatever you do, just don't turn loose because you, this is your chain and you're together. But anyway, I, I don't remember a whole lot of that, but it was, we shall overcome someday. And that's when we were thinking, 
If they keep on bombing Birmingham, that's someday going to come before we want it to. But anyway, that's, we just thought, you go to church and they're singing this old song about in the sweet by and by. <laughs> we don't sing that song anymore. No. But, yeah. But so many of those songs, especially those old hymns that the, the slaves have been teaching themselves, they're such powerful songs, though. So. Yeah. Do you remember any particular incidents when you're involved in the in the marches where you were confronted? There was the KKK or others? KKK didn't usually show up during the day. They show up at night. But I just, let's see, what is it? I was trying to remember one of the chants that they would have about blacks but it usually was nigger, not blacks. Um, go back to Africa, do whatever. And it's, no, I don't. I don't remember. I probably remember it after I think about it for a while, but I just didn't. I Would it be correct to say that it was the younger generation of African Americans who were really? advocating for resistance and the older generation was Let's see. more more conservative or more reluctant to push back? The ones that I remember when it came out, Stokey Carmichael and Raph Rap Brown. H. Rap Brown, I think. H. Rap Brown. I don't know, I don't remember where they were, but all I could think of, we wanted to get to them and tell them to shut up because they were they wanted to fight. And then I think right about the same time uh, Malcolm X came out and they wanted to fight, but we had been taught to be nonviolent. And that's when we thought we were going to lose the, the civil rights battle was when they started that because we figured somebody's gonna get killed out here. And that wasn't our intent. They were gonna kill somebody. We were already, you know, up people were being killed because mm -hmm. there were quite a few white people, I think, who died in that, those bus things and all that too. But we thought that once they started killing people, then that was gonna be world, we thought World War Three was gonna come on because they were gonna, if black people would kill white people, then we would really have a, a war going on. You mentioned yourself when we were talking mm -hmm. about these pictures and you're looking at these pictures, just how powerful a message that was to the rest of America as well, that mm -hmm. that was really helping to convince a lot of people that something had to be done. So what you had just talked about, if you're lashing back with violence, that it, you're just sending the wrong message then? I think so. That's when it started breaking down, I think. There was just so much dissension going on. And then even when I went to the military, people were, Martin Luther King was killed then, and some of the people who protested, all you need to do now is kill Rap Brown and Stokey Carmichael and all those people, and I'm thinking. So it got to be that people who you started getting along with were now spitting out the let's just kill up everybody, you know, that kind of thing. And that wasn't, especially when I was in Vietnam, I didn't want to hear that, <laughs> you know, so. Well, let's talk a little bit yeah. more about the college years. And and from here on out, I mean, the mm -hmm. civil rights movement is going to be woven in here, certainly. But you got to college in the fall of 62, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, how are you going to pay for college? Well, part of it was... I had graduated in January of 62, but I couldn't go to college until fall. And I was going to go to college then, but if I wanted to go anywhere else, I had to be 18, and I was didn't turn 18 until the summer. So I had from January all the way doing, I, I didn't, I worked at a, white person's house I was called the nursemaid so I made 
was five dollars a day and I saved it all up and I put it in an envelope and I put it under the linoleum floor in my mother's house and that was to be my college <laughs> but I had applied for I didn't get any scholarships even though I was number three in the class um I had I got a hundred dollar scholarship for something and so when I got I did have a I got tuition paid because even though Tuskegee is a private school, they allowed scholarships to Tuskegee so that we wouldn't be trying to get into any other school. So that was my part of my tuition for the first year. Tuition wasn't that much when you think about comparing it here, but on $4,000 a year, I had to hear at every school break that my sisters couldn't get a new coat or a pair of shoes because they were using all the money to send me to college. And uh, There had been nobody before you had gone to college? Among my the kids? sister had gone to the junior college. And she was when she got pregnant, and then she got out, and then she went to Cleveland. But um, no, I was the first one. And it's not just tuition, obviously; it's room and board. It was the tuition and the room and board. The room and board is what I think they were giving me a fit about my sisters were because it cost I think it was eighty five dollars a month or something like that. So that was a pretty chunk, pretty big chunk out of the family budget. And so I joined the army <laughs> and they gave me a whole, t my, my paycheck was 300 and something. So I okay. was in good shape. Uh, so when you say you joined the army, I Oh, I know what else. I pay for it. I had a national defense student loan was and that, that helped. Was yeah. that because you had joined the Army? Or? No, the National Defense Student Loan, you took that out because you needed money. And you were going to pay it back after you graduate. Okay. So. Did, did uh, Tuskegee have an ROTC program there? Yes. Okay, but let me back up and I want to ask you one other question here. Why Tuskegee? Why Tuskegee? This is one of the most prestigious African American historically black colleges in the country. Is that why? No. It was the only place where a black girl could go to nursing school. <laughs> no, they did not. Uh, they had nursing programs in Birmingham, but we weren't allowed there. Um, the historical black colleges are the only place where you could go anyway. So Tuskegee was in the state. If you went outside of the state, you're going to end up paying out-of-state tuition. So there was no question about Tuskegee. But I, I just never thought about going anywhere else because I knew that my daddy used to always say, have your bus fare back home and enough money to make a phone and phone call in the phone booth and that was about as far as I thought I was going to be able to go so that's where I went he tried to my father tried to get me to go to come up to Chicago and go to Cook County because he was told that they I could go there for three hundred dollars and it'd be a three-year program or whatever all I knew was didn't sound too right to me and um so he I was going to have to stay with my aunt for one thing, and I wanted to stay in the dormitory. <laughs> but, and I had that loan, so I was going to be good to go for the first year anyway. So, and I was, because I was a nursing student, I couldn't work on the campus either. Oh, really? No, only because we, they had a schedule for something all the way through. None of the nursing students could work. There wasn't enough time to do that? wasn't enough time. Our curriculum was pretty tight. Well, then tell me about the decision, you say, to join the Army. How did you, 
money was strictly it or was there other poles to that as well? Mm, it was mostly money for me, but a part of when we when they the recruiters came to our campus, they had the the army and the air force. The navy came, but they made it very clear that it's pretty hard for black nurse to get into the navy. And at that time, the army was recruiting nursing students, a uh, nursing, they were going to the school. And we didn't realize what was actually happening, but the Vietnam War was beginning to brew. <laughs> and uh, the Army had instituted the Walter Reed Institute of Nursing, but only, I think their first class was pretty much white. So what they would do, what the Army would do was that if they recruited the black students in Tuskegee, Dillard, I think it was FAMU, there was another school where the black students were, they would pay all of your tuition books and all of your fees, and then you get a salary. So my daddy was giving me $10 a month as an allowance, and that was to buy your necessities and to replenish your school supplies and stuff like that. So when they told me it was going to be a $300 check, it was pretty good. And that, that turned my daddy on, too, because I think I was, most of us were too young to sign ourselves in because a girl had to be 21, I think, to be considered an adult. Well, and, for the men, it was 18. If you were 18, you could go out and enlist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were not enlisting. We didn't. We didn't know what we were doing, really. But there was a class before us where they had 10 of the nursing students had gone. And we saw how they were living. And so we thought we would do the same. All of us went into the Army. There were nine of us. And uh, my first paycheck went back home because my daddy had had a um, boat accident. And he had all of his money in his pocket. And a lot of keys had come into a solid ball. And he was in the hospital. He got a big gash in his leg. So he was in the hospital for most of the time. And uh, after that, I kept the room in. Well, I kept, what did they send me? I kept about $25. And my mother just banked the rest of it or used it however they needed to use it. But that was how I paid for it. So I owed the Army three years when I got there. <laughs> so you're signing up and a commitment when you get your nursing degree for three years after that? Uh-huh. Okay. They pay for your last two and you owe them three. How much training then were you, were you required to go to while you're at Tuskegee and then the nursing program? At the time that I went in, your requirement was to keep a C average. And we didn't have, we didn't wear uniforms. We were supposed to have pretty much perfect attendance, but that was not a question at Tuskegee anyway, because you miss, you'd probably flunk if you missed more than twice. Um, but that was, our, that was our only requirement. We were attached to the ROTC but we didn't have to do anything with them. So they're all out getting her up early in the morning to do PT and they're learning how to march and they're doing all those kinds of things and and yeah. you're not doing any of that, huh? Well, we would call the Student Nurse Cadet Corps and our, our assignment was classroom. And that's what they told us. Your assignment is classroom, you are to Learn nursing as detailed as you can because you will practice it anywhere in the world. Well, and so that's the way we went through school and just knowing that that was our, our responsibility, that's what we did. What happened if you had one of your fellow students who didn't make the grade, fell below a, a, a C average or just never actually became a nurse? Was the Army expecting to pay him back then? Yeah, we had two to drop out. Um, well, 
one got married and she got pregnant and pregnancy was the reason to get out. I mean that they had to leave the program. Yeah, they had to leave the program. She left the program before we graduated. A couple of the other ones did not make, um, we had to pass the state board exam, which is what they call NCLEX now. Um, I think two of them did not pass that exam. But I was working at Tuskegee after graduation on a, on a special program. And less than 30 days after, I got my first paycheck on that job. And then I got, my mother called me and say, somebody from the Army called and said that you are supposed to be in San Antonio, Texas, less than a week from when she got that message. So I immediately went home and uh, started off on a train ride to Texas. Well, Connie, we're going to talk about all of that tomorrow, but a couple of questions to finish up for today. Um, and this goes back to the civil rights issues as well, I think. Were you getting some Red Cross training at the same time you're going through the nursing program? Pretty much we had had our Red Cross training in high school. Most of us did, but those who didn't, we did the first aid training at the beginning of nursing because if anything happened on that campus, we were pretty much it besides them going to the hospital. The hospital was on the campus, but if anything cost money, they came to us for the treatment. When you say if anything happened, are you suggesting Like if somebody that there had a threat? cut, if they had a cut or something, or okay. if there was what we call a, a civil rights breakout or anything like that, we might have been called in to Was there a just concern take care that there everybody. might be some kind of civil rights violence on campus? Not on campus, but if it had happened, like my classmate got killed out there, if there had been this mass dog eating up people and stuff like that, we might have had to respond to that. But we didn't. We didn't end up. Not much happened at Tuskegee. Did you enjoy being a college student there? Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were there sororities? I pledged. Um, my sophomore year, there was a nursing sorority. I pledged into that. And then I went in my senior year, I pledged into the social uh, sorority and that was based on grade points and stuff like that everything was you didn't get into that kind of stuff unless your grade point was up there last couple mm -hmm. questions for today then Connie I assume you did a little better than a C average how did you finish <laughs> <laughs> I would say I was a B plus but I you know there is I can look back at my transcript and decide this was classes that I liked and classes that I didn't, or this was when I was pledging the sorority, so the grade <laughs> point went down a little bit. But pretty much I would say that I was a B plus because at Tuskegee, you could only get two C's anyway. They said a nurse, a C nurse is not a good nurse, so. Had you figured they didn't out by that it. time that you had chosen the right profession, being a nurse? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Any last words about the, your experiences at Tuskegee then? I was also in the drama club then, and so I participated in a lot of the, the plays that they had. I tried cheerleading, but my voice wasn't good enough, but I did that. Um, I had a boyfriend when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was in veterinary medicine, so he did a few things. Um, we had movies. Well, at Tuskegee, there was this religious thing kind of transferred over because it was mandatory to go to chapel every Sunday, and you had a IBM computer card that had to be punched to show that you went or not. And if you didn't go, then I think you had to work in the cafeteria or something they do to you. But we went we went to chapel on in the morning. 
we would hook up and go to the church in the neighborhood after that we had and in the evening it was mandatory to go to vespers for the freshmen and sophomores and at vespers they would usually bring on maybe some opera singers and ballets and all those kinds of things but in the morning it was religious but they had a lot of mandatory you will do this kind of thing there and the nursing students were always in all of the graduations all of the parades because we had a uniform and we were considered the cream of the crop on the campus so what's your uniform look like it was a little gray dress with a white collar and white sleeves, and you had to put the collar and the sleeve on. You had a white apron that when we sat down, no matter what, you had to fold it over and so you don't sit on it. And then we had a blue cape with a red lining, and we would think we were somebody when we walk across campus and throw that cape across our shoulder. And, oh, my. Uh, <laughs> How about a, any kind of a hat? Yeah, we had a hat. Um, the, the hats distinguish what level you were in. We actually started to wear uniforms in the went the second semester of our first year, and it was plain. As you progress, I think in the third year, it was two stripes on the side. When you were junior, you had two stripes across the front, and then when you became a senior, you had one stripe across that we put on with KY jelly. <laughs> and uh, the shoes had to be perfectly clean. And on Saturday morning, that's what we all had to do. We had to spit shine our shoes, white shoes, because the, we would get inspected when we go in. We also had to have our meal cards inspected that a nurse is not a nurse if you don't eat breakfast. And so you couldn't go to clinical if you had not had your breakfast. After a while, we realized why you needed to have breakfast too, though, because if you smelled anything and you were empty stomach, you might want to mm. feel a little queasy. <laughs> mm. So that was, and then the other part was um, we did stuff. I was telling somebody this the other day that we actually had to deliver babies so it was required that we had to have six deliveries and 10 circulations, which means your circulation means you assisted. The 10, you were the primary person in that delivery. And the person who was the doctor on the campus was Bill Clinton's, it was his first selection for, to be Surgeon General, Henry Foster. They turned him down because he, there was the Tuskegee study. He didn't stop it, they said. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was funny, too, because I told my students at Governor State that I was at Tuskegee during the Tuskegee study, and they tried to, that thing started in 1930. You're not old enough to have been <laughs> there. And I thought, it finished in 1974. If I graduated in 1966, do you think I might have been there then? <laughs> and they look, yes, you were. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're running up to the clock today. Yeah. We've got a lot more to talk about. We'll get you into the Army. We'll probably have a couple more questions about your time at Tuskegee. I'm intrigued about the notion that you're actually helping to deliver babies while you're still in nursing school. So... Well, that was a requirement at Tuskegee for sure. Yeah, I wonder if it's still a requirement today. I don't think it might be. I, I should ask that question. I okay. should ask that question. More tomorrow, Connie. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, thank you.